Well, good evening, everyone. Look at all these faces. It's good to see you guys. I love Wednesday nights. It's kind of just kind of, it's kind of laid back, just kind of like we're sitting in our living room or something. So anyway, hey, do you know what book we're in? You keep a track? Jeremiah. Jeremiah, yes. Gold star, A plus, rewards in heaven. <laughs> Yes, we're in the book of Jeremiah. So uh, let's go ahead and open up to that. Tonight, we're going um, to get, I'm just going to do kind of like I did with, um, with Isaiah. I'm just going to take a night uh, primarily for an introduction to the book because it's such a big book. There's 52 chapters. And, and so I'm just going to give you uh, kind of an introduction to some of the just themes and thoughts and insights and stuff. And we'll take a look at chapter one, but mostly just an introduction tonight to the book of uh, Jeremiah. Let me just open in prayer. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for all of it, all 66 books. But this one in particular, Jeremiah, has something special in it for us tonight. I'm just sure of it, Lord, because uh, you have told us to, to seek, to ask, to knock, and you're just going to be faithful to... Um, to speak to our hearts, to feed our soul, to nourish us up in our faith and uh, just conform us to Christ. And that's what we, we also desperately need. And, and so thank you that you do what is necessary through the power of, of your word, the truth that is in your word. May it just renew our minds and give us hope and comfort and encouragement tonight. Pray, Lord, that uh, as you so ably do, that you would uh, correct us in those areas where we need that. Um, Lord, and that you would uh, instruct us where we have questions and are struggling with, with, with needing answers for something. I, I just know, Lord, that you know our hearts, and I'm thankful that we can gather in your name here, and I just pray that you would just pour out your spirit and uh, just help us to, to learn and to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah is the only prophet of whom the Lord says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's one of my favorite verses, actually. Um, I, I love that verse and all of its implications, and we'll uh, touch on that tonight a little bit. Um, but that's um, just an amazing thing. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And uh, Jeremiah was actually born into a family of priests. It's thought perhaps that his father may have actually been the high priest uh, at the time that he lived. And uh, he, he prophesied during the fall of Jerusalem. And as we have uh, considered in our study previously, especially in the book of Isaiah, there's a lot going on in, in the, the north and in the south of, of Israel. This is during a time of the divided uh, kingdom, of course, and, and uh, so Jeremiah was down south in Jerusalem, and the, the city's going to fall in his lifetime, and they're going to be taken uh, captive into Babylon, okay? So the Babylonians are going to come in and sack the place and uh, take them away. And uh, historically, it's, uh, uh, the date is 586 BC when that particular event takes place. It actually starts more like in 606. We'll, uh, I'll tell you about the timeline in a minute. But it, it kind of ultimately happens as, uh, in 586. But um, whenever a conquering army would come in and take captive of another uh, people, they would... They would they were very strategic in how they would do it, and they would they would take the cream of the crop. They would take the elite citizens, the educated, the the people that were prominent and powerful, and um, and they would just take them away to um, you know to their land, and um, and during that time, there's a lot of overlap that we're going to see um, there you know, in terms of other books of the Bible and other prophets and other names that are familiar to you. For example, Daniel was one of those elite citizens. Daniel and his three friends, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And they, or as they used to say in my Sunday school class, shake the bed, make the bed, and into bed we go, or something like that. <laughs> or maybe that was a baby. I don't know what that was. I heard that sometime. It was just kind of fun. Anyway, um, uh, the, that, that, you know, he was a contemporary. And so, um, <clears throat> 
But they were taken captive, and uh, of course the, the temple was destroyed, the city was, was, was ransacked, and, um, and they left behind the, you know, a certain remnant of the people, and people like Jeremiah that apparently weren't uh, deemed worthy of capturing, they left them there in the land. And uh, Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet, have you heard that? The weeping prophet, that, that is Jeremiah, uh, because his prophecies were accompanied by a sense of hopelessness. Um, I'm so glad that this isn't the only book in the Bible, because it, <laughs> it's pretty heavy. But we are really blessed, you guys, because we get to see it in light of the whole story. And we get to see God's grace and God's hope and God's salvation. So I, I love that. When I read the hard stuff in the Bible, it's always in light of the good news. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Don't forget the rest of the story. Sometimes, you know, you get just bogged down when you're in a, especially if it's a large book and the theme's just kind of over and over again. You're like, oh boy, you know, this is really heavy stuff. But you know what? It's always in light of the bigger picture of God's plan of salvation, this, this age of grace that we live in. And yet it's so good. It's so important for us to get the bad news. As I often tell you, you know, it's the bad news that makes the good news make sense. It's, you know, it's the bad news that makes the good news good, uh, you know, because we don't, if, if we never realized we were in trouble, then it wouldn't be any kind of hope or good news, you know, for the Lord to come along and say, hey, good news, you know, and I, I love you and have a great plan for your life. And well, what if you're someone who's just happy in your sin? And you say, I don't need you. I already have a good life, you know. And, and so sometimes we need to see the truth about ourselves, so we appreciate our need and God's provision for that need, that salvation that he offers. And so just remember, as we go through this, just keep it in the context of the whole story, and particularly uh, in the context of the gospel and the good news. But uh, his prophecies were, were accompanied by this sense of hopelessness. hopelessness. It was during a, <clears throat> one of the darkest periods in Israel's history, and, and Jeremiah had to come along and deliver the bad news. You ever have to do that? We don't like to do that. It's, I just, uh, I hate to deliver bad news. And so when we talk about being a weeping prophet, the, the kind of message that God uh, gave him to share was enough to make anybody cry. And, uh, and that was what he did. He did a lot of crying. And uh, the people had continuously rejected God. And the northern tribes had been, by this point, taken into captivity. And, and so Israel up in the north, or what is known as Israel, well, we look at the whole nation as, as Israel, but at that time in the divided kingdom, Israel was in the north, Judah was in the south, and the northern tribes had been taken into captivity, and, and they were suffering. They were suffering the horrible consequences of their sin. You know, we can learn from people's good example, and we can learn from their bad example, too. And I hope when you see other people struggling or suffering in the consequences of their, their sin that you take a lesson, but don't be proud about it. Don't be like, well, they got what they deserve. Listen, be careful. <laughs> Do you want what you deserve? You know, and, and so we, we need to be humble and we need to, to pay attention uh, when we see others, um, especially other brothers and sisters. You know, they're looking at their countrymen. They're looking at their brothers and sisters. They're looking at fellow Israelites and they're seeing that they're getting a spanking. And, um, you know, at this point there was a lot of division in the nation, but uh, their time was coming. And uh, they were suffering the horrible consequences of their sins uh, up north. But now it's going to make its way down into the south, into Judah. And, and despite the warnings, and don't you know, God, God is so patient and long-suffering, and he does warn. God loves us enough to warn us. And I've told you before, God doesn't threaten. There's not idle threats. He just tells you ahead of time what he's going to do. And then he does it. And, and so, you know, uh, he was, he, he, but, but the reason he warns is because he does love. And I like that about God. You know, sometimes we, we don't take the warnings seriously or we, we think that, well, God's just this angry, wrathful God. Well, he's angry at sin, but he's angry at wickedness. He's, he's angry at those things, but it's because that's the, 
that's the, the greatest threat to the object of his love. Do you get angry if your kids are threatened in some way? Does a mama bear come out in you? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's the way God is too. There, there's something that's a danger to you. And so, yes, he gets angry at sin. But <clears throat> what we see throughout this book and throughout all the prophets is this merciful God that's just pleading with people. He's warning, but he's also beckoning in his mercy. Please, at any time you can turn around. At any time you can turn around and come back to me. That's what he's just saying over and over again. But they didn't respond with repentance. Their, idol their idolatrous uh, rebellion just got worse and worse. It broke God's heart, of course, and it broke Jeremiah's heart. Therein lies another important lesson, I think, as we go along in the story of, of Jeremiah. Are you grieved by the things that grieve the Lord? When you see other people going through grief and hard times, um, does it grieve you? It really ought to. It really ought to. You, you know, I mean, we don't like to be grieved, but, but you know the Spirit of God is at work in your heart when, when you start to just become tender toward the things that are going on in other people's lives. You know, um, it, it's just interesting as I get older, uh, you know, some, I, I suppose some people would say, well, that's just, you're John, you're just, it just kind of comes with age, you know, you get a little more uh, emotional or something. And I suppose that may be true. There may be something going on physiologically in our bodies, in our body chemistry and things like that. But to be honest with you, I've seen some old bitter people and they're not very tender-hearted, and they don't cry for others. You know, they're just grumpy. On the other hand, I, I look to my older brothers and sisters in the Lord, and sometimes, sometimes I'll see it even when I'm when I'm speaking. You know, from up here, I have a kind of a cool vantage point to look and see your faces. Sometimes I'll say something, and I can just see the tenderness of the Holy Spirit in in some of you because sometimes you just your eyes, I can tell, you just fill with tears. And I just think, wow, I, you know, that's, there's just, there's just something of the Lord's heart, you know, when you talk about, you know, important things and serious things and uh, those things that are a, are a danger to us or a danger to others. And, and you've lived enough life to know what sin can bring and what it can do and, and how it can wreak havoc in relationships and life. And, and, and so there's just something that happens with the Lord over time that, that we should, that I think is good to learn from Jeremiah. We're gonna see in a minute, it's so much like Jesus, you know. This weeping prophet, you know, he wasn't doom and gloom, pessimistic, all about just, you know, seeing the, the, the darker side of life. God gave him a perspective for a reason at a point in time in the nation's history. And he said, this is what I see and, and it breaks my heart. And I want you to communicate to my people my heart. And a lot of people have this idea of God that he's just up there with a scowl on his face, you know, just waiting to smack you. And, and yet, um, I often tell parents, um, and, I, and I've, I've, I've learned this over the years. I'm still learning it, to be honest with you. I, I hope I'll be learning it my whole life. But, um, you know, when you're communicating with your kids and you're disappointed in something that they've done, I, I often put it this way. I'll say, um, anger, when, you, when that anger rises up in you, um, that parental anger over something they've done that's foolish or selfish or unkind or whatever, <laughs> And on one hand, the flesh can be really active. On the other hand, it, it can be a righteous anger, you know, because what they did was wrong. Um, but there's that struggle between the righteous anger and the selfish anger. And we gotta make sure we're angry for the right reasons. Are we angry because of how this affects others, how it affects God, or are we just, is it a selfish anger? But here's how I keep myself in check with that as a parent. I ask the Lord to, to use that anger to alert me to a problem, but don't allow me to use anger to solve the problem. 
Anger is good for identifying problems, not good for solving problems. <laughs> and we just get into trouble really quick. We're just sending up a storm if we, if we use anger to solve problems. It, you may, you may you know, win the argument, but you can lose the relationship, that kind of thing. It, it seems to be effective because now you know, people get moving. But are you doing damage in the process? And so when, you're ta- when I'm talking with my kids... I ask the Lord to help me to communicate um, sadness more than madness, <laughs> you know. And, and if they see in you a sadness over their sin versus, you know, I'm ticked off at you, then what that does is it, it not only does it preserve you from sinning, because I can have a bad attitude about my kid's bad attitude, <laughs> and for, with anybody else for that matter, but what it does is it preserves you from sin and it communicates God's heart. Because I don't think God is angry as much as we might think he's angry. I think he's, he, he is at times, but I think he's often more just grieved or brokenhearted over what he sees. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go through uh, Jeremiah. Um, because this is why he raised up this man, God raised this man up, is to communicate this broken heart of God. The compassion and sensitivity of, of Jeremiah gives us this unique picture of to what, into what God feels when he's rejected. I don't know that there's anything in life more painful than rejected love. Do you? I mean, I, I, I think about that, and I, is there anything more painful than rejected love? And that's, you know, it's, there's just, there's a lot of pains in life that we go to, but there's just something about love being rejected, you know, that, that is particularly heartbreaking. And, and, you know, and there may be other things you can think of, but don't miss the point. That's, that's, that's just a very, very painful thing. And, and this is what God wants Jeremiah to communicate. And, and most of the other prophets uh, communicated their message without sharing a whole lot about, you know, what they were or how they felt. Uh, Jeremiah was just transparent and vulnerable, and, and that humanity came through, that honesty uh, came through, which is, is just um, is so important, and yet he was still faithful to deliver the message. Um, there was a toughness to Jeremiah. There was a perseverance. I mean, he was, just because he was a weeping prophet doesn't mean he was a wimpy prophet, okay? (laughs) That's going to be clear as we go through. Uh, But we're going to see God's faithfulness as he continues to call his people to repentance. He still has a plan for them. And I like that because that's how God wants us to see him the way he relates to us too. Because we can blow it. And sometimes the enemy comes along and lies to us and thinks, that's it, you've burned all your bridges with God. I mean, he, you've used up all of his grace. And you know what? God is there just saying, come back, come back home. Come back home, my prodigal. <laughs> and, and yet he's, we don't want to presume on the grace of God. We don't want to take advantage of God's grace. Um, I, it can be a dangerous thing, but... but at the same time, we don't want to despair and think, you know, there's no hope for me or, or God can't forgive me or, you know, I've just gone too far and I, this time, you know, and that's just a lie from the pit of hell. God, God is, is he, he wants his people. And, we, and again, bringing attention to the whole context of the story and the whole eternal picture, God promises that he's going to redeem his people and he's not finished with Israel yet and he's not finished with you yet either. And um, it, it just hurts to see the tragedies that come about in our life because of sin. And yet, God is faithful. And, you know, he's not, his love isn't going to be, you know, overwhelmed or derailed by our failures. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting in this book is, is Jeremiah uses many different symbols. I think he would have been a good Sunday school teacher. But... I don't know. He may have been kind of a bummer because he was so sad. But, uh, but, the, but in this way, I think he was a very effective teacher because he used object lessons. He, he, he illustrated things. And it was like show and tell. I mean, he, I mean, he was communicating a sad thing. It wasn't, you know, an exciting message, but, but it was effective because he used object lessons. 
God said, hey, I want you to illustrate this uh, so they get it, so they get the point, they see. And a uh, very effective way of teaching. And uh, one time, he wore a, a rotten girdle. <laughs> you know, that's kind of weird. Yeah, it is, but <laughs> they got the point, you know. They didn't accept it. They didn't receive it, but there was no mistaking what the point was. <laughs> Another time, he put a yoke on his neck like an ox. Again, kind of strange. Like, I don't know that I would ever do that. I suppose I would if God said to it. Uh, you know, but uh, one time he broke a bottle in the presence of a ruler. He bought a field and buried the deed. And of course, in all of these, we'll see he gives the interpretation of what all this means. There's a whole list of things. Uh, uh, in chapter one, we see a, an almond rod. We see a boiling cauldron. Uh, we see uh, a marred girdle, I mentioned, the bottle. The, uh, uh, the drought is another illustration that we'll see. Chapter 14, it talks about the drought. Uh, the potter's vessel. One of the, probably the most famous chapter in all of Isaiah is the story about how he went down to the house of the potter. And um, there's, uh, it's just, it's just a, it's such a, a helpful and beautiful picture of God's grace and mercy. But it's a picture of brokenness. And, and, you know, there's a beauty to brokenness if God's the one doing the breaking. And, and there's something in that, that, that chapter is just really powerful in seeing God's heart and, and yet man's heart too. Because, you know, we can, he wants us to be moldable like clay and he wants to make something beautiful. But if we become hardened and don't say stop, stay soft and supple and moldable, then it has to be broken. Got to start over. You know, and so that's one of the pictures we'll see. Uh, another picture, two baskets of figs, uh, bonds and bars, buying a field, uh, the hidden stones. There's a book sunk in the Euphrates River. All of these things are objects, object lessons. I think it's really kind of fun and fascinating to see Christ in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, we're gonna see him pictured in many ways. Uh, see if the, you recognize these themes. The fountain of living waters. That's one of, the, one of the titles. That's one of the things we see in this book. Great physician, the great physician. Picture of Christ. The good shepherd. We learn about that in the Gospels. The righteous branch. Um, David the king, the redeemer. Uh, the Lord our righteousness. And so all of these pictures and object lessons are just uh, so helpful. Um, uh, he, he was the ninth of the prophets he prophesied to the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, which we mentioned before, and it was during the reign of five different kings. You're going you're gonna to read uh, of Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Don't say that five times fast, but uh, those are five kings. And, and um, he was, do you, remember, do you remember who the prophet was um, or, or who the king was in Isaiah's time? Hezekiah. And, and so Jeremiah was to King Josiah what Isaiah was to Hezekiah. And um, that's just something that we see as well. Um, so, uh, oh, one more thing, just, to, just kind of historically. There was, there was a lot going on in world history and, and kind of geopolitically at that time. Uh, a kind of you know, all these people trying to rule the world, um, just like it's always been. But at that particular time in history, the, the people who were vying for, you know, kind of to be the superpower, the reigning superpower, um, Assyria is the one who had, had been in power for like 300 years, but, but that, that was starting to, to weaken. Babylon was the one ascending to power. And uh, Babylon is is next to Jerusalem, Babylon's the most often mentioned city in the Bible. I mean, just New Testament, Old Testament. So it's important what we learn uh, whenever, you know, Babylon is mentioned. Egypt, though, also was, was on the scene and, and striving uh, to rule. Um, but in, in, uh, Assyria was defeated by Babylon. Egypt was also uh, overtaken by Babylon. And, uh, and then they invaded Jerusalem and they took the Jews captive. And one more thing to note that's going on kind of in all of this dynamic is false prophets. So all of this kind of crazy stuff is going on. And, and what, part of what makes it so crazy is there's still a very religious people. 
They're very religious. Now, they, they, they go into idolatry. They're worshiping the wrong gods, false gods. But it, it, they were kind of mixing and mingling some of their, you know, their own practices, their own traditions and stuff at the same time. So it was just kind of a weird kind of, you know, mixed bag of stuff. But there were, there were false prophets going on. And what, what you see is this tension between this true prophet of God proclaiming a message and there's these false teachers and false prophets that are pushing back and fighting. Does that sound familiar? Well, it ought to ring a bell because in the New Testament, what do we see with Jesus? What do we see with the apostles? We're learning about in the book of Acts. Where does persecution, the, the worst kind of persecution come from? And it, it, it comes from religious circles oftentimes. And so it's gonna be the same as we go through this. Um, <clears throat> all right, now, uh, do you remember the story of Chicken Little? Yeah. Kind of a silly little story. Um, remember she walks out and Acorn knocks her on the head? And what does she say? The sky is falling. <laughs> and, and then I have to go tell the king, right? And that's kind of what I think of when I think of Jeremiah. Because he's coming in and he has to basically say, he has to go to the king, he has to go to all the leaders, he has to, he, he's, make, he's making these proclamations to the people in power and everybody else who needs to hear it. But basically, he's going to be telling them the, the, the sky is falling and judgment is coming and, you know, the Babylonians are on their way. But these false prophets are going to be saying just the opposite. They're going to be saying, no, the sky isn't falling. It's fine. It's fine. And, man, that's the way Satan always is. Uh, if he can't out and out you know, deceive you into not believing the things the Bible says about our sense of purpose and urgency and living for Christ and serving the Lord and uh, leading people to Christ. If he, if he just, if, if he can't convince you that all that's just a big sham, do you know, the next thing he does is he just says, hey, okay, fine, but you don't have to be in such a big hurry. What's the hurry? Just take your time, you know. Don't be so serious about this discipleship thing, you know. And it's not that big a deal. And there's a lot of people like that even today in our culture. There's a lot of false teachers in, in, the, in Christendom and in the church that um, their message is always and only positive. There are some people that are absolutely famous for telling everybody this happy message about life and you can have your best you now and you know and the power of positive thinking and some of these titles and 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 these famous teachers and their books they write and their seminars and the stadiums they fill and they just go on and on and on and just blah 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 and it's and they're not doing anybody any favors I can tell you for sure because because they don't address they're not living in reality. And they're getting rich off of, of, of a lie. Because everybody wants to hear something true. It was so heartbreaking for me to be, um, I'm looking at my brother, Abby Oden, back there. Hey, Abby Oden. And uh, when we were in Nigeria, and uh, remember we were driving along, and we had those big, massive complexes where they have these big, you know, crusades. And, and there's such a vulnerability in places where there's such poverty, extreme poverty and hopelessness. And, and they're vulnerable to wolves in sheep's clothing who come in and preach a message. Like, you can be, you can be rich like me. But you, you gotta first give me a little money and then I'll pray for you. And, and you know, and then God will bless you. And, you know, and, and it's such a sad thing. And it, there's this, this, this false message. And I see um, in our nation today, oftentimes where, where people are speaking the truth and even doing it in love, um, not everybody wants to hear that. They, they want to feel good about themselves. They don't want to be convicted about sin. They don't want to be uh, exhorted to take seriously the the call to make disciples and care about other souls. Uh, it's just, I just, I just, I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be comfortable. And, um, 
you know, I like to be comfortable too. But I'll tell you, we can be lulled into a spiritual coma and, and just miss God's purpose for our lives. And, um, and, you know, that's the way it was in Jeremiah's day. Oh, it's, it's not a big deal. And they just, they were pushing back. Uh, Jeremiah, I think, was that unique and wonderful combination of tough but tender. He just had this ability. He, he was saying something that was hard. And he didn't want to say it. We're going to see in chapter 1, he was very similar to Moses. He did not want to take on this task. He wasn't just looking to go out there and, you know, tell everybody a bunch of bad news and try to put them in their place and, uh, you know, turn or burn. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't arrogant. He, he, he did not want to do this. And, and yet, he did do it. And I just, it's so easy in the face of pushback and rejection to become sort of jaded and kind of cynical. I mean, this life, there's a lot of things in life that can just um, make us weary and we just kind of start laying the bricks, you know, and we kind of build a wall and we go, I'm gonna protect myself. And, and we just become kind of hard-hearted and you know that's not God's heart we've got to be tough but there's also a tenderness and and we have a message of joy a message of hope a message of compassion a message of tenderness but it's important as we represent the Lord as we're ambassadors for Christ that we that you've got to trust the Lord and be brave and sometimes you have to say things that people may not want to hear um, and of course you do it in love and you do it with grace and, and you, you'd be as tender as you can be but you've also got to be tough and then when, when people push back and don't want to hear it or you know they, they persecute or attack you know you got to be really careful that okay I'm tempted toward maybe just being discouraged and well maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to do or what I'm supposed to say and, and you forget how high the stakes are all you have to do is say okay remind me again Lord what, what happens if, if I don't say this? You know, if you see somebody going down a road, a path to destruction, and Proverbs refers to it like, like animals going away to the slaughter. If you see people uh, going that way, do you not care enough to stamp in and say, hey, you know, brother, sister, I, you know, or is it like, nah, I don't really, that's none of my business, you know. And it's so easy to do that because we don't want to say anything that could be misunderstood. We don't want to certainly be construed as being self-righteous or judgmental. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to hurt people. But sin hurts people. And sometimes we got to realize we're called to a rescue mission with God to go, to go and speak the truth in love. And of course, do it with humility and grace. But do it by all means because if we don't do that, you know, that stakes, you know, who knows what, what the end is going to be. Um, God may bring someone else into their life to do it. But, you know, my Bible says that there's going to be a lot of people who actually perish. And they may do so rejecting the faithful preaching and, and outreach of love of people like you. But we certainly don't want to, to watch people go that way and not do anything about it. And, uh, but it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to be a prophet. It's, it's hard to, to speak the truth in love and to, to partner with God on a rescue mission. But you know, I, God still sent them. They rejected the prophets. They rejected Jesus. They rejected, rejected the apostles. But not everybody rejects. That's, that to me is what's so exciting. That's what I love about being a pastor teacher and about you know, uh, evangelism and about just ministry and reaching people with the gospel. I love the fact, and you never know when it's going to happen, but some people will listen. And that is such a faith builder. When, when someone actually listens and you get a chance to, to, you know, have spiritual children and grandchildren, you know, to be able to see and say, you know what, the, those folks are going to heaven because I don't know how God used me, but he did. 
And it's very humbling. You say, man, I know, <laughs> I can't believe what God's done. And it's such a faith builder. And so I just want to encourage you that um, there's lessons for us to be learned in the example of Jeremiah. Yes, he's going to get a lot of pushback. Yes, he had to preach a hard message. But his life tells me uh, something very important about God's call in my life as well. And for every Christian, if we're going to be faithful, we want to be tough but tender. And we want to speak the truth in love. And we've got to trust the Lord to do it, to fulfill our mission. And, um, and these are just good qualifications for any leader. Um, and, um, I, you know, you guys ever heard of Stuart Briscoe? He, uh, he's, a, he's a good pastor. And, and, and he, said, he gave a description of a good pastor one time. He said, a good pastor should, be, sh- uh, a good pastor should have the mind of a scholar, the heart of a child, and the hide of a rhinoceros. <laughs> yeah. And all the pastors say amen to that. <laughs> so Jeremiah, just a tender warrior. Um, do you remember Jesus uh, one day? In Matthew 16, we read this. Um, one of the rumors that went around about Jesus, people were saying, you know, they were speculating about who he was. And they did that with John the Baptist as well. And people were trying to figure this stuff out. And, um, you know, it, but with Jesus in particular, he finally said, who do, men, who do men say that I am? As if he didn't already know. But he just asked the question, who do, who do men say that I am? And remember, they said, well, you know, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist. And there was one more guy. Some say Jeremiah. That's, that tells me something really important about the, Jeremiah. I, you know, why would he say that? Well, apparently there were certain characteristics about Jeremiah that were also present in Jesus. Jeremiah could be tough. Jesus could be tough. Um, you remember the time he... <laughs> go read Matthew 23. And just this litany of woes to the Pharisees, scribes, hypocrites. I mean, he just let them have it. And he was tough. Remember the time he came in uh, to the temple and started turning over tables and running people out of there, you know? So much for gentle Jesus, meek and mild. <laughs> it was, he was tough. And, um, and yet, on the other hand, there's so many glimpses of him that we see of tenderness. You know, you see the harshness of the self-righteous people. I think of the woman caught in the very, it says, in the very act of adultery. And they came and they threw her down at the feet of Jesus. The law says we should stone her. What do you say? You know, and they were trying to entrap him. They were certainly cruel towards this woman, using her as a pawn to get to Jesus and all this. And, and you're thinking, wait a minute, where's the guy? <laughs> You know, and, and there's this tenderness. And he just says, he says to her, woman, where are your accusers? After he kind of runs off all the hypocrites. And she says, nobody's here, God, just you and me. <laughs> and he says, yeah, and I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. He addressed her sin. He was straight up, you know, stop sinning. You wouldn't be here in this situation if you were living the right way. You're sinning. And yet, he's saying, but I'm not condemning you. He says, I'm, for, I'm, I'm forgiving you. And, but I'm calling you to live a different life. I'm, I'm, I, and, and, and it is the grace of God, the Bible says, that draws us to repentance. I love that. But Jesus was tender like Jeremiah. Remember the time Jesus said to the paralytic, uh, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. So this weeping prophet, um, Jesus again. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers young under her wings, but you were not willing. Um, next week when we get really diving into the, the whole text, um, we're going to see a basic outline. It's very simple. The interesting thing about Jeremiah is it's a little bit different than a lot of other books. It doesn't follow a real clear uh, chronology. It's, it's a little bit random. And most Bible scholars say that 
probably the reason for that is just that, first of all, it was, it was a very labor-intensive and, it, you know, task to write, you know, in the ancient world. And they wrote on animal skins and papyrus, and they just, you know, they rolled it on scrolls. And probably he would, and, and a lot of his messages, he probably preached multiple times. You know, he was an itinerant minister. I mean, he just traveled around and he just proclaimed the word of the Lord. So, so these were given orally many, many times. And, and he would stop and he'd write. And then he'd later, he'd, he'd pick it up later. And sometimes what he would write would be a message that wasn't necessarily current, but it was a message that he pulled out of his sermon file from previous. And so sometimes there are, you know, kind of things that seem to be earlier in his ministry and life uh, and, and things later. And it's kind of bounces back and forth. And just don't be confused by that. Just realize that was just kind of how God's providence, he put it all together. But, um, but if you had to break it down to a simple uh, outline, this is what I would do. I'd suggest, uh, interestingly, the, the, the first would be preparation. And that's, that's kind of the first point. And it's only one chapter. Chapter one is, is kind of preparation. Uh, chapter two would be proclamations, and, and it covers like most of the book. Chapter um, uh, two uh, through almost the end of the book, I think uh, 51, chapter 51, two through 51, is just proclamations about Judah, proclamations about uh, different parts of the kingdom. And then the last one, it kind of wraps it up with a prediction. Um, the third... Uh, out, part on the outline would just be prediction and, and that comes at the very end, the last chapter basically kind of recaps everything and predicts what's going to happen and in fact, of course, it did happen just the way God said it would. So, um, that is the introduction um, and I think, Tad, don't fall over in shock now but I think I'm going to invite you to come back up and uh, let's prepare our hearts uh, to just continue in worship and and just pray about some of the things that that um, that we've heard so far, Lord. Thank you for the book of Jeremiah. Thank you for the life of Jeremiah. Thank you, Lord, that um, that you're God who tells us the truth. You do it in love. Uh, you're as gentle as possible and firm as necessary. You. You are tough but tender, and we see that in this man, and we learn that that important quality can, can be ours as well as your Spirit's working in us, that, that as we live in a fallen world and we face such intense spiritual opposition, there's, there's a need to have on the armor of God and a need for your protection and a, a need for real courage and toughness to stand in the fight and not, not give up and not run away. Not run away from you, not run away from the battle, but to just trust you and to stand. And, um, and Lord, all of us need to be grieved over the things that you're grieved over and for the reasons that you grieve because ultimately you want our very best and you want the very best for all of your creation. And I, I pray, Lord, that we would see just how great your love is, that you would tell us this whole story and you would show us the end from the beginning and all of the messiness in between. But ultimately, Lord, we, we see hope because even in the midst of the brokenness in this world, the brokenness in our lives personally, and um, we just see that, that you're a redeemer. And Lord, we are the clay and you are the potter. And there's something you're shaping and fashioning. There's something you're doing in each one of us. And Lord, I pray that we would, we would trust your, your strong and skilled hand at work in our hearts and lives. And I pray that we would learn as well to be instrument in our Redeemer's hands, Lord, that, that we look at, as we look at the world around us, that we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't shrink back from our call, that we realize that you also knew us before you formed us in the womb. And you called us and you appointed us and there's something specific you've given us to do. 
And may we not shrink back from that task. May we move forward um, with the hope of the message of the gospel and be willing to preach it to ourselves first and then to share it with others. And so give us your heart, we pray in Jesus' name.